forward to that day. Someday soon we're going home to be with Jesus Christ. What a day that's going to be. Let's invite the presence of the Lord in this place. Can we lift our hands toward heaven and welcome his presence? Lord, we thank you tonight for your love, for your grace, and your mercy, Lord. We thank you for all that you have done. Father, we pray that in this service tonight, Lord, that you would have your way. Lord, through every song that is sung, through every word that's spoken, Lord, that it all be done to bring glory and honor to your name. Have your way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? He is worthy. Spread the tidings round Wherever man is found Wherever human hearts And human woes abound Let every Christian tongue Proclaim the joyful sound
heaven somehow Though the devil kiss me and he tries to turn me around He's offered everything that's kind of me But the wealth of worldly fame If I could have still I would have taken nothing for my journey now Well it would take nothing for my journey now Gotta make it to heaven somehow Though the devil kiss me and he tries to turn me around your Bible, turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, I will begin with verse 3 and conclude with verse 14. Matthew 24, verse 3 through 14. The Bible says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, 
and then shall the end come. As you look at these words of Jesus in Matthew 24, there is absolutely nothing else that needs to take place that would prevent the soon coming of Jesus Christ. This could be the day that we see Jesus. And my prayer and heart's desire is, Lord, would you keep us ready for your coming is very soon. Would you lift your hands one more time and let's pray for God's blessing on this message tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for that blessed hope of your soon return. Father, I pray that tonight as we study your word, God, that you would open up our hearts and our minds to receive the truth of your word. Lord, that our lives would be changed forever by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. Just before Jesus ascended into heaven nearly 2,000 years ago, he was telling the disciples about things to come in the last days. However, Jesus was more concerned with the mission of these disciples. He had already told them before to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. And then in his last words on the Mount of Olives in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 11, the Bible says that Jesus was assembled together with them, and he commanded the disciples that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since. When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou now at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel. And Jesus said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they yet beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. That was a promise that was given to the church of Jesus Christ nearly 2,000 years ago. And today in the 21st century, uh, there is a message that has been preached for over 2,000 years. The message today is just as real as it was back then. The message that Jesus Jesus Christ is coming soon. It is a message that is true. It is a message that is prophetic. And I firmly believe that it is an event that will take place very soon, perhaps in our own lifetime. This could be the day that we see Jesus. In the 24th chapter of the book of Matthew, Jesus and four of his disciples had journeyed with him from the temple of Jerusalem. They had gone up to the Mount of Olives, and they were overlooking the buildings of the city of Jerusalem. Now, the disciples of Jesus were always curious. They wanted to know about the end times. In Matthew 24, verse 3, the disciples said, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And if you will remember again, in Acts chapter 1, they were still curious. They wanted to know about the events of the end time. But Jesus said to the disciples, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons in which the Father is put in his own power. Instead, Jesus was commanding these disciples to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost because he was going to enable them with a supernatural power to preach the word of God so that lives would be changed, that people would be set free, that the work that Jesus came and started in this world, these disciples would be able to continue through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus gave instructions for these disciples. He was preparing them for the trials and the persecution that the church would face prior to the rapture of the church. Jesus told them that they would face evil treatment. They would be meeting the enemies of the gospel. And so when these disciples were asking Jesus about the coming of the end times in Acts 1, that's why Jesus said, it's not for you to know 
But here's what's going to happen. You're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And this power is going to enable you to be a witness. There are a lot of people today in the Pentecostal circles that have a misunderstanding on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Listen to me carefully. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is not to get you ready for heaven, but the baptism of the Holy Ghost is to allow you to help other people get ready. God wants to empower you. He wants to equip you so that you can live your life here on earth for the glory of God so that you can tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. The same power that Jesus had when he walked on this earth, that same power is available today to be used by you to pray for the sick, to preach the word of God, to witness to people, to proclaim the message that Jesus saves, that Jesus heals, that Jesus baptizes in the Holy Ghost, that Jesus Christ is coming again. The same ministry that Jesus had is available for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. It makes no difference who you are. It makes no difference what your past is. It makes no difference what you've done in life because when your life is under the blood, when your sins have been forgiven, there is therefore now no condemnation you are a new creation you have been saved you have been renewed you have been empowered you have been washed clean by the blood of the lamb hallelujah to his name when you get full of the holy ghost god wants to equip you to carry out his ministry that it began in this world so why do we need that power in the last days there's going to be deception there's going to be people in churches preaching a message that is not backed up by the word of God. In Matthew 24, verse 4 through 5, Jesus answered them and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. In the very beginning, God created mankind with a very special ability to choose between what is right and what is wrong. But throughout the history of humanity, both men and women have started out on their journey. They began living for God. Many of these people have been used by God in ministry. But listen, Satan knows how to get people distracted. He knows how to get people's attention. And it's through deception, it's through satanic deception that there are people who were once in ministry, they were once filled with the Holy Ghost, they were once saved and on their way to heaven. Today, it's it's because of deception they are now lost, destined to spend eternity in hell. You see, it is deception that draws people away from God. A lot of churches today deceive believers by preaching a false sense of hope that you can be saved all at once from your past sins, your present sins, your future sins. I never read anywhere in God's Word where Jesus said, I'm going to save you from your future sins. But he said, go and sin no more. When you're saved by grace, you have a responsibility to voluntarily turn away from that old lifestyle. Does that mean life is going to be perfect? Absolutely not. Are you still going to make mistakes? More than likely, yes. Why? Because we're human. But there's a difference. Listen to me carefully. There's a difference between making a mistake and doing something intentionally. There is a difference between a sin and a trespass. Oh, really? Pastor, can you explain the difference between a sin and a trespass? Sin is a mistake. Sins are things that we do sometimes not even realizing that we've done it. It's a mistake. But a trespass is a voluntary action. Anyone ever been deer? How many deer hunters we have in here? Or hunters of any kind? Ever seen the sign, no trespassing? That doesn't mean come right on in. It means stay out. There is a border right here, and it says no trespassing. It is a forbidden territory. But when you're living in the sight of grace, and you're walking in the grace of God, sometimes you're going to have a stump. Sometimes you may trip and make a fall. 
but you don't stay down. You get up and you keep on walking. Sometimes the enemy's going to try to throw a curveball at you, and sometimes you may be taken off guard and you may trip and stumble again. That's a sin. But you don't stay in that sinful condition. You continue in your walk with God. And the Bible says that when we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who's making intercession for us. And all we have to do is confess our sins before him, and he is going to forgive us of our sin. But what if we make a trespass? Trespass is not just accidentally tripping and falling. A trespass is when you know there's a boundary you know there's a lifestyle over there that God says, stay away from it. Separate yourselves from it. But a trespass is accomplished by doing just this. You see that you're not supposed to trespass. You see that you're not supposed to go over there. But you voluntarily cross over that line and you get into a place where you don't belong, where you don't need to be. And when you do that, that's what you are doing. You are trespassing against the grace of God. You've gone against the bloodline. You've gone against his grace. You have voluntarily abandoned that sinful lifestyle. A lot of people ask the most ridiculous question and say, can you lose your salvation? You can reject it. You can. You can be saved and you can throw it all away. There's scriptural references that shows that. Judas Iscariot was one. He threw everything away that he had. He could have had the opportunity to repent. He had betrayed Jesus. He could have repented. Peter denied Jesus. Peter repented. Peter went on to preach the gospel. Judas hang, hanged himself. He rejected it all. He rejected the life that Christ had to offer. There's a lot of people in hell today that are there because they voluntarily left the grace of God. They left the grace of God. See, God has created us with the ability to choose between what is right and wrong. You see, salvation is a journey. If you don't continue on the journey, how do you expect to reach the end of the destination? If you don't stay on course with Jesus Christ, how do you expect to make it to heaven? That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, they that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Don't be deceived, church. We must continue on our journey. We must endure to the end. We must cross the finish line. It's not over, church, until God says, that it's over. There's a lot of deception in our world today. The mainstream society tells us that we need to respect our so-called Muslims, so-called Muslim brothers and sisters, they call it. Listen to me. I absolutely refuse to vote for a Muslim. I do not trust a Muslim. Islam is demonic. Islam is from the pits of hell. I do not believe that they worship the same God that we do. We do not serve the same God. The God that we serve says, thou shall not kill. If, if it was true that Jews, Christians, and Muslims serve the same God, then why is it Muslims want to destroy Israel? Why is it that Muslims hate America? Why is it that Muslims want to annihilate the Jewish people? They want to destroy Christianity. I tell you the truth. Every Muslim that's in office today in the United States have talked about their desire to bring Sharia law into our nation. And if the truth be known, if our government keeps going in the direction that it's going, and we keep putting these liberal people in office, such as what we have in the White House today, that anything goes who haven't got a clue what common sense is about, They've totally disregarded what real science is. We have a whatever you want to call it serving on the Supreme Court who can't even tell you the definition of a woman. She says, I'm not a biologist. I don't know what it is. Science tells you they have totally disregarded common sense to try to bring about a new political agenda. There's deception in our world. 
we are told by many so-called preachers today that there are many ways to heaven, that if you just want to live a good life and, and be sincere in what you're doing, that, that God will overlook all the wrong things, that God's not going to look at what's wrong in your life, but he's only going to look at what's good. That is nowhere found in Scripture. Jesus clearly says in John Chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other way to salvation except through Jesus Christ. That's why Acts chapter 4, verse 12 declares, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If we will look into the word of God, we will see that even in the days of the early church, uh, there were people who were once living for God, but through deception. They declined from the ways of God. They declined in their faith in Jesus Christ and their life was shipwrecked. Their life was in ruin. You see, when people are subject to deception, when they are subject to deception in their faith, that is when they quench the love of even the most established Christians. You see, disappointment is experienced not only by the one who has fallen from the wayside, but it affects every person that they know. It affects affects people in their family. It affects people on their job. It affects people in their church. You see, one person can make a difference. So many lives depend upon what you do. If something happened in your life and you allowed yourself to get deceived, you allowed the enemy to take control of your life, not only is it going to run your life, but it's going to run the lives of those who are around you. You see, there's a lot of people that look up to you. There's a lot of people that admire you. There's a lot of people that when they grow up, they want to be just like you. How dare you lead them down the wrong way and allow the deception to take over in your life. The generation in which we live today, we're being taught that we need to be tolerant of everything to accept everything that comes down the road. Homosexuality is literally being shoved down people's throats. The gays, the lesbians, the transgenders, the bisexuals, the whatever they want to call them, living in a sin-sick lifestyle. And society says we need to accept them for who they are because they want to express themselves in their so-called alternative lifestyle. And so many people today are accepting it as normal, and they're accepting it, and even there are churches today that are allowing homosexuals to preach in our pulpits and to teach in our children's ministries and to allow transgender people to be in leadership in boys' ministries and girls' ministry. I, for one, refuse. And if there ever comes a time that the Assemblies of God gets more relaxed in that standard church. We will not, I say, we will not affiliate with any so-called Christian denomination that endorses such perversion because it is a lie. It is from the pits of hell and God says it is an abomination. We will not be a part of it. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 20 verse 13 that if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman. Both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death, and their blood shall be upon them. Today's generation, we have reversed our values. The things that was once something that we talked against are now things that we endorse and things that we do. But Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil. But listen to me tonight, church. That is exactly what the United States of America in this day and age has done. We have been deceived. We have reversed our values. And today we have ridiculed the absolute truth of God's word. We've called it multiculturalism. Today we have endorsed perversion. But we call it an alternative lifestyle. We have exploited the poor. But we call it the lottery. We have rewarded laziness. And we call it the welfare. We 
have killed unborn babies, but we call it free choice. In return, abortionists have been shot. It was called justifiable. Today, we have abused power, but we call it political gain. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography, and we call it freedom of expression. Church, the world today has allowed themselves to be deceived, but our prayer and heart's desire is that God would search our hearts, that he would know our hearts, that he would know our thoughts, that he would change us, that he would create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Church, there needs to be revival. There needs to be revival in our homes. There needs to be revival in our personal life because we can never, we can never have revival in the church until we can first have revival in the home. And the only way there can be revival in the home is that there must be love. There must be unity. There must be something that is greater than you and I that comes from the throne room of heaven and allow God to quicken our hearts and to anoint us and empower us and fill us with his love, to fill us with his spirit, to be what he's called us to be. And if we can have a revival in our church, there's going to be revival in the church. If we can have revival in our family, there will be revival in the church. There will be revival in the community. And there will be souls that are saved, lives that are changed. And this community can be turned upside down. But it first begins in our own heart. Begins in our own heart. When the disciples of Jesus asked what would signal his return, Jesus gave them several things to look for. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 8, Jesus said, These signs are only the beginning of sorrows. Many Bible scholars today interpret the beginning of sorrows as being like the onset of labor pains. In other words, when a mother is going into labor, she begins to have these labor pains, and the closer she gets to giving birth, the more frequent these pains are being experienced. And so Jesus is, in essence, telling us that the signs of his coming is going to start out very mild. It's going to start out uh, very uh, sporadic. But as time goes on, these signs are going to get more closer together. They're going to be more intense and more severe the closer and closer that we get to his soon return. And so what are the signs of his coming. Jesus says that in the last days there's going to be false Christ. There's going to be false messiahs. In the past several decades, there have been many so called religions that have had their leaders who have claimed to be the Christ. There have even been so called Christian churches that have been led astray by pastors who have claimed to have some divine message that does not match what is written in God's Word. Nearly 1,600 years ago, Muhammad claimed to be the final messenger of God. Today, there are many Muslims that believe when Jesus foretold the coming of the Comforter in John chapter 14. The Muslims believe that Jesus was referring to the coming of their prophet Muhammad. In John chapter 14, verse 16, this is what Jesus said. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. And so the Muslim people interpret this as the prophecy of the coming of their prophet Muhammad. Now, if they believe in the word of God, many of them believe in the life of Jesus Christ, they will tell you the teachings of Christ. In fact, I have spoken to many Muslims, and to be very frank with you, Muslims can sometimes quote the King James Bible better than many Christians can. That's how they're able to deceive you. But if Muslims truly believe in the Word of God, then they need to examine what Jesus is talking about here concerning who this comforter is. Because Jesus said that the comforter was a spirit. 
Muhammad was not a spirit. Muhammad was an ordinary human being, had a natural birth, and had a natural death. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would be with the apostles beginning in just a few days after his ascension. Muhammad didn't come till after four, after 500 years later. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would be with us forever. Muhammad came 500 years later. He lived his life and he died and he's buried. And so the fact is that the prophecy of the coming of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Comforter, as we sang about a few minutes ago, this prophecy was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, where they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. Long story short, Muhammad is a false prophet. He is a false Messiah. He is from the pits of hell, but yet there are millions of people around this world who follow his teachings, and their hatred toward Christianity, we even have people of this particular faith who serve in our national government. God help us if more of them come to power. That's why it's so important that every child of God exercise your right to vote and put godly people in power. We need, we need a change all across our nation. Thank God we have made a little bit of progress in this last election. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Back in uh, 2000, what year was it? 2020. I preached a message here on the Sunday night or the Sunday morning before the presidential election. I preached a message called, I'm going to vote for Jesus. I did not endorse a single presidential candidate. I never mentioned any names. All I did was talk about the principles. Well, we got censored. Little church in Howell, Oklahoma got censored. Facebook completely blocked our church YouTube channel. Every video that had been posted on Facebook from the time I had first became pastor was completely removed. And I was not even able to post anything new. The morning after election, everything's back to normal. Are they scared of a little church in Howe, Oklahoma? I don't know. But listen, there comes a time when we need to proclaim the truth. Now, I'm not saying that the Republicans have all the answer. I'm not saying the Democrats are completely out of their mind. 98.9 and 99.9% of them are. I, I, have, I have talked with both of them now that I'm, I am serving as, as a Republican county treasurer. We're completely non-legislative. I'm not trying to be political, those of you that's watching online. But I'm telling you, there are people that are out there. They affiliate themselves with these parties, but they say, you know, I'm not like the rest of those. You know, these are the ideas I believe. But you're registered with that group of people. And when you register with that group of people in the primaries, that's the only group that you can vote for. And so if that's the people you're voting for, you're voting for people with those kind of values And you need to be sure that when you vote, you're voting God's ways, God's principles, God's laws. Because if you're voting for people that are for same-sex marriage, if you're voting for people that's for abortion, then you are in essence saying that you agree with what they're doing. Now, there may be somebody else that you can vote for that's totally against that. But they may cuss like a sailor. They may say every word in the book. But... If their principles and their policies match what's written in the Word of God, I'm going to vote for them. I'm not voting for them because they're a nice person. I'm not voting for them because I like the way they talk. I'm voting for them because I like the way they vote. Because they vote the way that a child of God needs to vote. It's the same way if we were needing some work done in our house. If I needed a plumber... I could care less how nice of a person he is. I want him to be able to know how to do the job. You know, having good character does help. It's it's great to have somebody pleasant to work with, but I'm more interested, can they get the job done, and can they get the job done right? In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talks about wars and rumors of wars. 
In the original Greek, war is taken from a word called ethnos, E-T-H-N-O-S. This is the word that Jesus is using here. He said there's going to be ethnos. This means an ethnic war or a racial war. There was one newspaper in recent times that says today there were 67 different wars being fought around this world. Most of these wars are ethnic wars. For example, within the last 75 to 100 years, can you think of all the ethnic wars? You've had the Jewish Holocaust, the slaughter of multitudes of Jews. You have the wars in the Middle East between Jews, Muslims, and Christians. You have uh, the attacks that were made on the United States on September 11th, 2001. Uh, a few years later, there was the Boston bombing. Today, there were conflicts in Ukraine. There were conflicts in Iran. There were conflicts in North Korea, Afghanistan, Iraq, and who knows where else there were conflicts being taken place. And most of those conflicts are based upon religious faith religious faith the muslims hate america since simply because we are not muslims their idea their method of evangelism is to annihilate anyone who does not agree with their faith that's why they hate the united states jesus said that in the last days there would be disease and pestilence pestilence is an incurable disease Pestilence is also a pandemic. In the last few years, we have had the coronavirus that has swept across this nation and has killed thousands of people. There was a time even here in our own church congregation where we were affected greatly by the coronavirus. In fact, in February of this year, or in January going into February, in one week, over 20 people in this church family was infected with the COVID-19 virus. We had to shut down for a couple of weeks, including myself, that many of us were very, very sick during that time. This is just a small example of the things to come. Jesus said the closer that we get to his soon return, the more frequent these events are going to take place. There were diseases today that were once considered conquered and under control that are now reappearing and oftentimes they're reappearing in a drug-resistant form. The AIDS virus, for example, was unknown a hundred years ago. In 1930, there was the first case of a, a virus that later became known as the AIDS virus. In 1959, it is reported that there were two people that died from a virus later known as AIDS. In 1966, the United States has its first case of the HIV virus. And since 1981, here in the United States of America, nearly 2 million people in this nation have been infected with the HIV AIDS virus, including nearly 700,000 people who have already died from this deadly disease. If that's not proof that we are getting closer to the end time, Jesus is talking about earthquakes in diverse places as another sign that we are living to the soon return of Jesus Christ. Now keep in mind, earthquakes have always happened. There's always been earthquakes. But when you look at the history of earthquakes in recent years, they keep getting stronger and they keep getting more frequent. For example, looking at the uh, geological website, I was able to obtain some information about earthquake history around the world. In the 1960s, there were 13 earthquakes recorded with a magnitude 6.0 or greater in the 1960s. In the 1970s, 51 earthquakes measuring 6.0 or greater. In the 1980s, 86 earthquakes measuring 6.0 or greater. Throughout the decade of the 1990s, it was recorded over 100 earthquakes measuring 6.0 or greater. But between the year 2000 and 2010, measuring 7.0 or greater, there was over 200 earthquakes of that particular magnitude. In Luke 21, verse 25, Jesus said there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, distress with nations, 
perplexity, the sea, and the waves roaring. Just a few years ago, as I was getting ready to go to work, I had flipped on the, the news that morning and was watching on Fox News as the meteorite took a Russian town by surprise as that meteorite exploded and crashed into the suburbs of their city. Today, our nation is divided. The United Nations around the world cannot agree on who can use nuclear weapons and who cannot. There have been tsunamis and large uh, catastrophic storms around this world. In fact, just a few years ago, the Associated Press reported that the most intense Atlantic hurricane season produced 11 hurricanes, 8 tropical storms, and nearly $8 billion dollars. And damage. That lets us know today that the world itself, the earth, is groaning and pleading with humanity to let them know that Jesus Christ is coming soon. And so prior to the coming of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that the gospel is going to be preached throughout this world as a witness to all nations. In Matthew 24, verse 14, Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the world for a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. This prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. From the beginning days of the church till just a couple hundred years ago, the only way the gospel message could be preached around this world is preachers and missionaries would have to walk from city to city or ride a horse or ride a boat. The invention of the train made it possible for the gospel to move from one state, from one region to another much more quickly. Then you have the invention of the vehicles, the automobiles, and you're able to drive across town and you're able to drive from one state to another and across the nation. And then we have uh, air, airlines and, and people are able to communicate. And then you have radio and television. And now we have the internet. And what's amazing is even how Assembly of God is able to get in on this because for the first 90 years of this church's existence, the only way this church got the gospel around the world was to send missionaries out and to send money overseas and to proclaim the truth of God's word. And now we have Facebook Live and we have YouTube and we're able right now while we are having the service, there are people who are watching live on the internet able to see and hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ. There are people in other nations that tune in and watch. And here in this world today, the world is hearing the gospel message. Every nation of this world is hearing the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That lets us know, church, it's just about over. Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world as a witness to all nations and then shall the end come we're about there church we're about there he's coming very soon but also in the last days there's going to be godlessness there's going to be a great falling away 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7, the Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. For anyone who has ever watched television, read a newspaper, or lost a retirement to corporate greed and corruption, or just walked outside your front door. It is very obvious today that this prophecy is being fulfilled in our generation. Our leaders are becoming more corrupt. Our cities are filled with crime, brutality, neon signs proclaiming our sinful, godless nature. Our libraries, our schools are promoting the homosexual agenda. Real science is being 
put aside in order to promote a new idea of thinking. And they're teaching our children in school today that you can now choose what gender that you want to be. That you can have surgeries to reflect what gender you want to become. But I want you to understand something tonight. In the end, you cannot change your DNA. And regardless of what people think, regardless of what they choose, regardless of what decisions they make and what kind of surgeries they do to their body, they cannot change their DNA. You cannot change the number of chromosomes in your body. That DNA will yell louder than ever that that person is a male or a female. Jesus gave us the signs to watch for, to know that his coming is near. But the exact time of his coming is not for us to know. That's why it should be so important for us to be ready as if Jesus Christ would come this very day. In Matthew 24, verse 36 through 39, Jesus says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The Bible compares the coming of Jesus Christ to be just as it was in the days of Noah. For over 100 years, Noah preached that the judgment of God was coming as he prepared the ark for the salvation against the flood that was soon to come. But the world rejected Noah. The world rejected his message. But when the time came, Noah and his family entered into the ark. Once they were saved, once they were taken out of harm's way, that's when the judgment of God came in the form of a flood and destroyed all life as we know it on planet earth. Likewise, for over 2,000 years, the church of Jesus Christ has been proclaiming the gospel message. And we've been proclaiming about the judgment that will come upon this world. And the moment that Jesus Christ comes to take out his church through the rapture, the Bible tells us that the judgment and wrath of God is going to cover this entire world. But church, remember, the Christian has no need to worry. The child of God has no reason to fear because we will be raptured away before the tribulation period begins. Church, time is precious. If you only knew how soon Jesus Christ was coming. If you knew that you only had 24 hours left to live here on this earth, what would you do with that time? Would you want to give messages to your loved ones or try to pack in all the pleasure that you could? There's a lot of things that we may consider. But the most important thing we could ever do is to be sure of our eternal destination. You see, the truth is none of us knows how much time we have left. It could be today. Jesus could come this very day. He could come tonight. He could come tomorrow. He could come before this service is even over. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 14, Whereas know ye not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. The Bible warns us in Amos chapter 4, verse 12, prepare to meet thy God. You see, our greatest danger is to delay. There are people today that delay beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ. They say, I'm young. I have lots of time left. I want to live life. I want to have a good time. When I'm ready, then I'll come to know Jesus Christ. When they're ready, it may be too late. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 2, verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and it was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? You don't have to refuse salvation to lose it. All it takes to lose out on eternal life is to simply delay. So many people today are spending eternity in hell because they thought they had lots of time. They thought they had plenty of time left to get things right with God. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 40 through 44, 
Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be working at the meal, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what hour the thief would have come, he would have watched, and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Church, prophecy today is being fulfilled. Jesus Christ is coming soon. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, the Bible says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Very soon, Jesus Christ is coming. The trumpet of God is going to sound. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 15, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed the apostle John had a glimpse of what was going to take place in a future judgment in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 through 2 and in verse 11 John says after this I looked and behold a door was open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was sat in heaven, and one sat on that throne. You see, John saw people gathered before the throne of God. They were worshiping God. And in verse 11, it says, They shouted out, Thou art worthy, O God, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. When we see Jesus Christ, we're going to worship Him. We're going to praise him. We are going to declare worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the one who overcome the grave. We're going to shout out holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And we will worship forever the King of kings and the Lord of lords. For he alone is worthy to be praised. I want to ask our choir if you will come back up to the platform. Brother Coy, if you will get that song ready. When Jesus comes in the clouds. Brother Shadow, I'll be at the piano here in just a second if you can help me on the drums. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what happens then? The Bible says that we're going to live forever in a land where we'll never grow old, and we're going to live forever in the presence of God Almighty. In Revelation chapter 21, the Bible says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as the bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But church, I want you to remember this next verse. It says, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable 
the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers, idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The only ones who can enjoy this eternal life to come are those whose names are written in the book of life. The ones that have been saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You see, every one of us is going to face God. We're going to be judged. You see, both the Christian and the sinner is one day going to face God. The Christian is going to face the judgment seat of Christ. The sinner is going to face the great white throne judgment. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, John says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Church, I want to remind you tonight, Jesus Christ is coming very soon. All you've got to do is look around and see the things that's taking place in this world. Every day that you wake up, it's a day closer to the soon return of Jesus Christ. I do not know when he is coming, but I do know this. He is coming very soon. He is promised in his word. The word of God declares in Acts 1, this same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. When he ascended into heaven, he went up into the clouds. When he comes back from heaven, he is coming back in the clouds. Church, it is time to look up and rejoice and know that our redemption is drawing nigh. It's just about over. This life here on this earth is just about over. And very soon we're going to hear the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ are going to rise and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Church, can we stand together and can we come together around this front and can we worship the Lord this choir is going to minister in song, and let's allow the Holy Spirit to work in our life and to get as close as we can possibly get before the trumpet of the Lord sounds because Jesus Christ is coming soon when Jesus comes in the clouds. Oh, what a shout will rise across the vault sky when Jesus comes.
for that blessed promise. We thank you, Lord, that you are coming very soon. And Father, I pray that you will help us, Lord, to be watching for you. Lord, help us to be waiting, to live our life for you, Jesus, for your coming is very soon. Father, I pray that you will touch this church family, God, that you will strengthen us, Lord, by the power of your spirit, Lord. Strengthen our families, God, to be everything that you have called us to be, Lord, to serve you with all of our heart, Jesus. And Lord, we give you praise. We bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? He is worthy of all the praise. We bless his name. I tell you what let's do before you leave tonight. Greet somebody, tell them that you love them, and tell them I look forward to meeting you over there.